Hello, 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 hello. Are you ready for the session on building a career in impact? Yes. Wow. <laughs> All right, we can do it better, right? Are you ready for the session on building a career in impact? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's my crowd. I love it. I love it. This session is uh, incredible. Like, first of all, did you know that uh, an average human being works about 90,000 hours in their lifetimes? That's the time that we spend working. Any workaholic here? People that love to work, they feel compelled to do something bigger than themselves. So you can double that. That's about like 180,000 hours like me. <laughs> so the way we spend our time is the way that we spend our life. And so when, if we do something that is meaningful, if we can do something that makes a difference, if we can do something that makes an impact, then we win and the world wins. And that's what we are going to talk about today. In fact, we are going to explore different uh, ways in which you can build a career in impact. Whether you want uh, a career, whether you want to start your own business, whether you want to replicate something that is already existing. We are going to explore that throughout the session. And in fact, we are going to start with our first uh, keynote speaker, and she's, gonna be an, she's an example of an impact entrepreneur. She's the founder of Conexio and is a social startup that promotes socioeconomic inclusion of vulnerable population, inclu including refugees and migrants, giving them quality training in digital skills. She has been nominated Forbes 30 under 30 in the category of social entrepreneurship, and she also was nominated by Forbes, Elle, and Sista as one of the women entrepreneurs to follow in France. So without further ado, can you please give a massive round of applause to Jean Guo. Hi everyone, thank you Simone for that very, very kind introduction. So I'm Jean Guo, I'm the founder, executor, director of Connexio. Our mission is to bridge the digital divide for the world's most vulnerable. So I would like to start by presenting to you three stories. Passi, she's originally from Guinea. She left due to a forced marriage and she's been working as a cleaner for the last few years. She wants to become a payroll administrator, but she needs digital skills in order to do that and was not able to find free training until Connexio. Julie comes to France from Brussels at the age of 18. She originally was not able to get her diploma recognized in France given the difference in education systems between the two countries. She started in delivering processing packages, but she didn't want to stay in that domain. And Stan. He's originally from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and he had been living in the Jaleka refugee camp of Malawi for over 12 years without any access to work opportunity. These are just three of our students who faced different barriers to economic opportunity and were not able to realize their full digital skills potential. Today, we know that there are huge negative consequences to digital exclusion. Just in Europe alone, there are nearly 170 million people of working age who do not have the right basic digital skills to work. We know that digital exclusion is first and foremost closely associated with unemployment, given that nearly 90% of those who are digitally excluded face some sort of unemployment challenge, and also closely associated with socioeconomic status given that one out of two individuals who are digitally excluded are considered low income. So therefore, for us, bridging the digital divide is more vital than ever, because those who are disproportionately impacted are those who are the most vulnerable. And this has only accelerated with the pandemic. We've jumped forward seven years in terms of digital acceleration and the use of technologies in our society. And we know that given in Europe, 90% of jobs today require some basic form of ICT skills, and that 86% of job seekers use digital tools in their job search. It is vital and important to make sure that 
We need to tackle the digital divide first in order to address bigger issues like unemployment and also inequality. So my story started when I was on the ground working as a researcher for over two years. I listened to a lot of stakeholder interviews, really trying to assess what were the needs. I saw that as a researcher, there were, access, uh, there were solutions that provided basic access to frontline services, but that there was really a gap um, in 2015, 2016, when it came to enabling um, some of the students I was working with to go on a better path, uh, a longer term path to professional development. Having a data science background and also having come from the tech sector myself, I saw that digital upskilling and digital tools were an inevitable step to the future of work. And there's also a very personal conviction to my story as well. As the child of immigrants, if I hadn't had mentors, uh, advisors who had pushed me, I wouldn't be here standing before you today. And so there's a very personal story behind Connexio and enabling every single person to get the fighting chance that they deserve. So what is our mission and our vision? Our vision is to ensure that we want to create an inclusive society in which no one is marginalized due to the lack of access to digital skills. And our mission in doing so is to prepare our students for the jobs of the future and support them in the best way possible. For us, our mission is more and urgent and important than ever before. As we've seen with the increasing digitalization trends, our work is to make sure that the status quo does not remain the same and that those who are digitally excluded do not fall further and further behind. You might ask, who are those who are concerned by these issues? I can tell you that there is not one age or sector or gender or other criteria that can escape the reaches of this problem. We work with youth who might master social media but not be able to send formal emails or create CVs. We work with those who see their jobs digitalized in their different sectors of activity. And we also work with different individuals who want to upskill and transform job opportunity and in going into a new sector. Concretely, uh, at a high level, Connexio offers multiple learning solutions and pathways. We have learning solutions that really target the fundamental building blocks of digital literacy, enabling individuals to acquire the basic skills, fundamental skills for a daily professional and personal life. We work also on more advanced learning tracks that take into account workplace digitization and how to prepare those currently in jobs to really advance and anticipate the changing skills revolution. And finally, we also build learning tracks that get into the tech profession with pathways that start from awareness building to certification and work experience. Connexio in the last few years has really built a certain expertise and being able to identify and work uh, in terms of our pedagogy with the different target groups. For us, what's important is to ensure that those who are unserved today, potentially by other solutions, uh, are included in this digital era. Second, we also work closely in partnership with other organizations to provide comprehensive support and wraparound service. We won't, don't want to have a student not be able to continue a course because they're not able to find stable housing or access to other basic necessities. And finally, we work with a strong network of corporate and private partners who help to jumpstart the integration pathway for our students, which range from mentorship, uh, soft skills coaching, to job dating opportunities, and direct recruitment of our students. Uh, since 2016, when we are founded, we've launched more than 300 cohorts of our different training groups, uh, nearly 3,000 students who've gone through our programs, and six months post-program, there are 72% of our students who've either successfully integrated into the labor market, pursued a degree-seeking program, or launched their own entrepreneurial ventures. Today, bolstered by a team of more than 50 uh, people on our team, we are present in four countries, uh, 15 cities around the world, and we have more than 40 training sites in which we operate our activities. 
For us, uh, going international outside of France was also thinking about seeking out strategic high impact locations and where there was the need, but also the stability and infrastructure to deploy successfully our solutions. And finally, a long-term strategy for continuing to develop our international footprint. Currently, Connexio has two uh, models of scale. We have one in which we directly replicate our training activities on the ground, which enables us to continue to improve our service delivery. And we also have a model in which we empower uh, and actually build capacity at the level of other organizations, uh, which is more the case in our international model in Kenya, in Jordan, amongst other countries. And this enables us to marry the best of our technical expertise and training solutions with the operational muscle and the local knowledge of our partners on the ground. What is our end game, you might ask? For us, there are two important aspects to what we hope to achieve. The first is that we aim to continue our mission of working to empower the next generation of individuals and organizations so they do not have to suffer the consequences uh, as a result of exclusion to the digital divide. And second, we see as we grow into an increasingly digitalized world that the access to basic digital skills should be as universal uh, access to inclusion as other basic rights. So you might ask, uh, what has become of some of the students I had presented uh, early on to you at the beginning of the presentation and their stories? Passy today is well on her way to becoming a payroll administrator. Julie finished the developer program at Connexio, earned her first diploma in France, was recruited at a startup, and actually has returned to work part-time as an assistant trainer for future Connexio students. And Stan. Today, he earns a stable income doing online freelancing as a certified technical writer and translator. He's been able to settle down, get a, um, get a house, uh, get married, and really be able to further develop in his life and his community. He's also actually come back and worked as an assistant trainer for future Connexio students. As global crises loom around the world, the situation in Ukraine amongst others, it is more important to, than ever to help to prepare uh, for the future. And for us at Connexio, that means equipping individuals with the right skills so that they are able to continue to build economic opportunity for themselves, no matter where they are, either directly through our programs or in partnership with other organizations. So in the second part of my talk here, I've actually been tasked with providing the social entrepreneur perspective lens. Uh, and so I will present in the second phase of my talk some suggestions or tips, things I probably would have wanted to share with myself um, embarking at the start of this journey. Uh, mind you that some of these tips are my own tips, but, um, and some of them apply maybe to just building ventures in general or building uh, ventures in more our category, given that we have in the nature of the problems, we try to solve specific factors to take into account. So the first uh, of the suggestions I like to give is this idea of being able to start before you're ready. I think if you are a perfectionist, which I imagine there is a good part of you amongst the group, you'll want to build a solution and have it almost be perfect before you launch it. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that first version is not going to be perfect, and that's actually perfectly acceptable. Because what we want to build is something that's going to be continually improving and changing and evolving. And in order to do so, you need to build something and test very quickly. So it's more the value and test and learn. 90% uh, of that value will come from iterating very fast and being able to develop your project. So I'd say without hesitation, if there are those entrepreneurs amongst you, really think about what is that first iteration, that minimal byproduct I will build, and then how do I iterate and continue to improve that? The second um, is this thought about your end game. So I mentioned that in our presentation in relation to Connexio. The Stanford Social Innovation Review has written a great article about this, and I think what's good about it is it really puts you in the mentality of when you build your venture, what is the bigger problem you're trying to solve for right at the start? 
uh, it's important to think about because it might impact your, your long-term strategy for where you want to build your organization, what you're trying to solve, and what does 100% mission achievement look like. So in their article, for example, they outline options including government adoption, meaning that if what you're building is actually a public good, does that mean that eventually, if it would be 100% mission achievement, this would actually be integrating your solution into government public services or part of other um, a national, uh, more public um, solutions. There could be a solution regarding rendering your solution open source, so making it so that anyone can access the code or uh, the content behind your solution and diffuse it as quickly as possible, a little bit in the style of Wikipedia. And finally, there might be 100% mission achievement in which, um, in an ideal world, maybe the solution no longer needs to exist and no longer need to fight for that battle. Uh, there is a US organization called the Education Superhighway, for example, where their mission was to achieve 100% connectivity in US households, which they're very close to achieving. So I think coming back to thinking about what the overall end game is, how you will plan that into your long-term strategy uh, is an important question for social entrepreneurs. Uh, the next, and I think this probably applies to any venture in general, is thinking about recruiting a team around you with the right values in mind. I think it's important as you embark on this journey that you will have to federate others around you quite quickly, others that not only have these values but are also able to represent and diffuse them uh, out larger in the world. At Connexio, Diversity and inclusion are important values that we strive to achieve because we strive to build in our team, first and foremost, the diversity we want to see reflected in the world. So we have a team, seven nationalities in four countries. We speak more than 15 languages. And for us, we have very different diverse technical backgrounds that range from very technical uh, digital to non-technical and very specific um, education backgrounds as well. I think thinking carefully about what are your first uh, values and how uh, the people that you draw into your team adhere to those values is very important. Uh, I think I like to always talk about the ambition behind what we do, uh, one of the research studies has actually shown that social entrepreneurs are more likely, 15% more likely, to be more risk-taking than maybe classic entrepreneurs in the sense that the nature of the problems that we're solving, whether societal or environmental, are actually more challenging. We have to take into account more barriers and obstacles on our roadmap to building a successful venture. And so I think in that same realm, we should also be as ambitious as uh, taken as seriously and build and run organization as powerfully as any other type of venture. I'm in the belief that as uh, the number of challenges we'll, we will be facing in the world in the next few decades continue to loom, we will need impact unicorns, uh, structures and ventures that are big enough to be able to tackle the world's most pressing challenges. One of the last tips I leave for you is talking about shared value partnerships. This is the idea of saying that what we build, uh, the one plus two, one plus one is clearly more than just two, uh, in the sense that in the number of solutions we need to build, it's thinking about how do I cleverly rely and strategically rely on partnerships in the ecosystem. For Connexio, I can give uh, two examples. One is what we do when we try to work with organizations to build wraparound service support, so we ensure that a student is not dropping out because they can't get housing or they can't get access to basic services. Uh, and the second is our model in empowering and building other organizations to achieve impact through our programs. Uh, that is the marriage of very um, different expertises on both sides for the partner and for ourselves. Uh, and finally, more on a more personal note, uh, one of the things I would have told myself if I'd started this six years ago was thinking about this as really a journey. What you're building is going to take time, even if we're going to iterate fast. Building a team, building that credibility, um, it's going to take time, a lot of time. But I think the magic is also in what you're able to bring, the stability and the infrastructure that you're able to build that can last. And so building with kind of that end in mind, the end game in mind, and also recruiting a team that has those right values will be critical steps to achieving this. Um, I'd like to leave you with one last quote. Uh, this is from the founder of Ashoka, Bill Drayton. Social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or teach how to fish. They will not rest until they have revolutionized the fishing industry. So I think the 
end message here is to say that have high ambitions, go forth. I know there's a lot of great energy, motivation to achieve more, and I think we're not gonna be satisfied until we've actually really changed things for the better and for the future. Thank you so much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Jingwo, give her a round of applause. Thank you. Wow, what an example of a social entrepreneur thinking about uh, the, the problems that we are solving and then creating an enterprise that can solve those problems uh, that uh, make a difference. And uh, one of the reasons why I particularly love this session, it is because, as Jean said, access and accessibility is a big defining point uh, in how people are going to see themselves, what kind of careers as well they are going to go into. And uh, I remember I, I'm Italian, as you can see. Yeah, right? <laughs> and I moved to London when I was 20, and like any good Italian, living in the UK, what do you think I did? Working in restaurants, right? <laughs> I didn't have a clue about what to do. And I remember my restaurant manager, he was the one that got me into the world of social impact. He said, you got to go to these kind of events, go to these seminars, read these books. And I was able to create a career and businesses in the social impact space. But why was it happening? Because I had someone that opened doors and gave me access. And that's what we are going to be talking in this panel. It's all about access. What tools can we use? And where do we go if we want to build a career in impact? And this is why I want to introduce our panelist, which is Laure French Brouard from the Snowball Effect, Ernst Hustra from MVU and Erasmus Enterprise, and then Ngui Kimani from B-Lab Africa. Give them a massive round of applause, please. As you can see, uh, she's joining us uh, remotely, so thank you very much for being here. Well, let's start with the uh, law, um, Snowball Effect. Uh, I know that uh, the work that uh, you do with Snowball Effect is to give ideas for people to become an impact entrepreneurs, and in particular, showcasing uh, ideas that are already working, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Tell us a bit more about how it works and the work that you do. Yeah, exactly. So what we do is that we identify solutions that are having a great social or environmental impact um, and a proven business model. And we help them find entrepreneurs all over, all over the world who are going to replicate the same concept by learning from their initial founders. So it's not like just there is an idea and I pick it up and I just copy it. It's I collaborate with their initial founders so that I develop a franchise, a license of the same concept or something different. I mean, there are different scaling models. Um, so yeah, we give access to, entre to entrepreneur social entrepreneurship to people who are just not having an idea yet, but still the strong desire to do that. If I don't know where to start, if I don't know where to go, let's look at projects that are already existing, already working, see if I can be involved in any of these projects and give them even more life. We're going to talk about some of the projects uh, later, because now I want to also welcome uh, Nguyen Kimani. Thank you very much for joining us uh, from uh, B-Lab East Africa. And uh, she fosters impact, and the work that she does is fostering impact uh, entrepreneurship in Africa, and also linking academic institutions uh, in Africa with B Corps to facilitate uh, graduates uh, getting into impact careers. Uh, Nguyen, what's the reality in Africa, and what is some of the work that you're doing? Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to join even by remote and very excited to see NVU as well, which is a B Corp. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. As you know, Africa is the youngest uh, continent in, in, in the world right now. So um, very solution driven. Uh, we have very um, great opportunities to collaborate. We have a growing ecosystem in the impact space between impact accelerators, climate change champions, renewable, renewable energy solutions. So there's a lot of space to play in, even in consulting, I must say. 
Uh, we're going to explore some of the opportunities uh, that there are in particular in Africa and East Africa uh, in a moment. I want now to introduce uh, Ernst Hustra, from uh, CEO of uh, Erasmus Enterprise uh, and also on the board of Envue, which helps uh, concrete impact projects uh, around uh, the world. And in particular, you have uh, an emphasis and focus on uh, people development. So tell us a bit more about the work that you do in these two hats that you wear of Envue and also uh, Erasmus Enterprise. Yeah, thank you, uh, Simona, and thanks for, uh, for having me. And um, just to start off with Erasmus Enterprise, um, it's a daughter company of the university. Um, and uh, we are really uh, tasked to give uh, a real meaningful uh, solution to exploiting your entrepreneurship. And most of us, most of the people here in the room, they're at university or higher education. And the things that you don't learn is often about experimentation or that you are actually rewarded to start a venture and it's actually discouraged most of the times you don't get points for it you don't get time for it it's a lot of uh, stress and pressure that you have so what we have established as Erasmus Enterprise it gives the people that save space to actually experiment to come up with an idea to f bring that further to the next step to really see if that has a merit to it the tagline for the university is creating positive societal impact. So henceforward, it's not that easy because we have 4,000 scientists. If you would ask them individually, what does that mean? You get 4,000 different answers. So we feel that building a bridge as entrepreneurship can be to, those, uh, to that tagline, creating positive societal impact. And uh, as a pillar, we say act as an entrepreneur and then with the emphasis on act, so do it, rather than sit on your hands, read the books, do your exams, but also explore life, right, yeah. with entrepreneurship. So we give them that safe space. And the second part I will allude on uh, later on. Thanks. So we're going to talk about Envy in a moment, but that's the, the difference between learning and acting. And of course, we need to learn before we act, otherwise we don't know where to start <laughs> and what to act on, but at the same time, we need to start taking action. Uh, talking about actions, uh, Nguyen, what is uh, the reality in Africa in terms of industries that are growing in the social impact space from uh, your point of view and w where are the opportunities? Mm -hmm. So one of the greatest uh, spaces right now is the agribusiness space. I think one of the things that uh, COVID taught us is that we all have to eat and it's an essential service to grow food and also distribute. So um, a lot of activity right now is, is around sustainable agriculture, um, distribution services also. Uh, same thing with renewable energy, um, whether it's, it's alternative or it's renewable, um, that space is, is really coming up. But interestingly too, what we are seeing is there's a lot of conversation around the SDGs and individual businesses, especially SMEs, also some large enterprises and financial institutions are taking the sustainability um, issue very seriously and looking for ways in which they can improve their operations so that their businesses can be more sustainable, um, looking for tools that they can use to measure and manage their impact as they are doing that. Um, so there's there's a lot of opportunity even in the consulting space to, to help the small businesses as well as the large enterprises who are on this journey to achieve certain SDG goals um, to make sure that they are making the right decisions and the right changes, sensitizing their employees and their supply chains on the things that they can change to effectively attain whichever goals that they have set for themselves regarding sustainability. Um, so. Those few, I would say, uh, are the first point of starting. And uh, definitely, you mentioned the consulting space being a, a big one, because uh, businesses need to evolve, need to adapt, need to change. And most of the time, they don't know where to go. So this is a big opportunity which is growing on top of the other sectors that you mentioned. Uh, I wanted to ask a lot in terms of opportunities now, because you see a variety of projects and a variety of business models. What are some of the business models that uh, you see and that you offer as well with Snowball Effect when in terms of replicating something that is already existing? 
Um, so we have projects in the environment, the inclusion and the education, so it's super broad. Actually any type of project that is just positive can enter in the portfolio. Um, it just needs to be local. And I like to have the example maybe of Green Salon Collective. So we have 18 solutions and you can discover them all on our booth actually. Um, but in Green Salon Collective they are recycling hair and chemicals from hair and beauty salons and they transform them into composting and they also create create those type of little pillows of hair to soak oil in the water. Um, and they have a really cool concept and they are looking for franchisee all over the world. I like that project a lot. Uh, I like Ticket for Change too. I mean, I've been working for them before. It's um, a school for change makers in, in France and they're looking for people who are going to replicate the same concept everywhere as licensees. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, many other, like 18, there's even Connexio in our, in our portfolio. So yeah, really a broad landscape. What I'm curious about is also the business model because uh, yes. I remember having a conversation when we were preparing for this panel and uh, I immediately mentioned franchising. Yes. Because uh, yes. when in terms of replicating something which is already existing, franchising is the first thing that comes to mind. But you said, no, no, franchising is not the only way. No, yeah. So what are some of the others? There is quite a large spectrum uh, coming from something that is more centralized where the people who, the person who is going to replicate depends a lot on the initial team. So it could be a, a director for a new region, you're an employee. And then step by step, we go into something that is more, where you have more freedom as a replicator. So you can be a franchisee, you're your own boss, but you have the same brand. And then you can be in a license, so you have a little bit more flexibility. And then there are other models that people know less, though so they are super impactful, where you replicate the same concept without necessarily replicating the same brand and that's close to open source actually uh, we have in our in our portfolio um, the first zero weight shop who was ever created in in Germany in 2014 and now if you look at Europe there's so many zero weight shops everywhere and it's partly because Milena Glubowski the founder created an online course to teach other how to do the same thing right. even if it's not the same brain it's just the same concept and then there is a last very, very powerful one, it's affiliation. You do different con uh, the same concept, different brand, but you're part of the same umbrella organization. I oh, love it. And I have, there is one example I'm going to mention later that uh, I saw at your stand that really caught my attention. But I want to move to Ernst now. And uh, uh, with uh, MVU, you are really focusing on uh, talent development mm -hmm. and importance of talent development in particular because we need great people <laughs> to do great work. So what is the type of work that Envy does? What does he offer? And uh, how does this talent development work? Yeah, sure. Let me uh, sort of um, just, just to finish probably off at university what you don't learn, right? Sort of, and, and then, uh, uh, for instance, um, we run challenges really on, on certain themes like the uh, energy transition. Uh, 35 teams are in there. They come up with ideas. And then what, right? Sort of, and this is also what Envy Envy is a venture builder that was uh, already started 2004. They started with their own uh, activities to see sort of, hey, how can we make change and use venturing as a means to an end? Um, so we have um, probably now started over 24 ventures at the moment. We start off with a good idea, a niche in the market. For instance, we, uh, we are running a, a handful of projects in East Africa uh, for food preservation which is a big issue for the farmers. They want to uh, sell their produce as quickly as possible because there's no meaningful way that they can preserve that part. So we set up a project together with local, uh, local farmers, together with IKEA Foundation, actually to set up, uh, uh, to set up a, a solution. That's project managed partly with students, but also partly with volunteers and partly also with people that really engage with that impact, vis uh, with that impact vision. It's a massive success. It has this societal sort of I would say dividend that you can create, uh, but it's also a talent development thing yeah. because the people that are executing in the project, there are the next generation who want to be part of that. So rather than they, they learn about the farming, they learn how to make that a bit better business model. Right? Not only a better business model, but also creating impact. Yeah. And this is how you would like to advance and top that up into new, a sort of a stage layer. And starts as a small ID, building bigger and bigger, and yet this is also where you can create the impact. So again, comes back to the act now. 
uh, what, I, uh, what I alluded to earlier. I, ca I can see the, the flow that there is from uh, Erasmus Enterprise to Envue. It's almost like there is a start as Erasmus Enterprise, to think about ideas and start getting your feet wet <laughs> in different projects, and then building the venture with, uh, with Envue and this incredible project and developing themselves and the skills that they are needed to yeah. make that happen. Yeah, and it, is very, it, it sounds very logical, and it's a little bit reverse engineer that it all makes <laughs> sense. But at the end of the day, because it starts at different yeah. uh, locations with a good idea, and you have to be enabling that part, yeah? capture that energy, uh, so that ha it has to have a certain structure, obviously, otherwise people would be running all, all directions. So you still ha have to get that a structure, but also kill IDs in an early stage. Yeah. People have to get used to it. You know, it's not bad if we kill your ID because it's not, not carrying fruit in this, uh, in this literally in this instance. It's not flying, so we stop it, we go back to the drawing board, yeah. and we go for the next one. And that is so exciting because, especially in next generation, they love to, uh, to work like that. And, and sometimes it's also hard, being an entrepreneur myself, you know, sometimes you get so in love with your idea that it's like, oh, this doesn't work, it, it's soul crushing, but at the same time it's a learning experience uh, and you develop all the skills that uh, you had to develop in order to make it happen. And uh, I want to talk about tools now. And Gwing, I know that uh, B-Lab is uh, an incredible resource for tools for uh, social entrepreneurs, for people that want to have uh, careers in, uh, as a change maker. What are some of the tools that uh, B-Lab offers uh, and where can people find them? Um, we have two tools at the moment. Um, one is the B Impact Assessment Tool. This is a tool that enables for-profit organizations to measure and manage their impact. The tool covers five different areas. So if you're building a business, really consider using this tool from the onset. Um, it's gonna help you set your, your foundation and then help you improve along the way. So it measures your governance. Um, it, it would ask you questions relating to what kind of practice, your governance practices you're putting in place to ensure that your business outlives you pretty much and has the impact that you're setting out for it to have. Um, it also measures um, your relationship with your workers. So there's a worker section. We'll take you through all the policies that you need to put in place. So if you're looking for something that would act like a checklist for you to keep you on track, um, that would be helpful. It measures your impact on the environment. So as you're thinking about sustainable business practices or or being a social enter entrepreneur, thinking about how your relationship with the environment affects your community. That's a good uh, area to guide you around that. And because I have raised community, that's the next section. So that's section four. Um, and then the last section is the customers. So that's the B Impact Assessment tool. Um, you can find it online at b-impactassessment.net. Um, then you can also uh, consider our SDG Action Manager tool, which we co-designed with the UN Global Compact. And uh, this one basically helps you decide which SDGs that you want to work towards as a business. It would ask you questions, it would give you ideas, it will create space for you to set goals um, for your business at the time. And if you're looking for a career in impact, this would also give you some ideas. Uh, one of the programs that we run um, at B-Lab East Africa, and certainly I think in other B-Labs, B-Lab UK and B-Lab Europe, they have the B-Leaders program, mm -hmm. where if you are a consultant and you're looking to help businesses that are on their way in this journey, you can take that course, definitely, and learn how to walk businesses on their impact that's, journey. That's brilliant. And how can people can find that? And where can people find the second assessment? Um, on the, still on our website. So you can go to b-labafrica.net. And I remember the SDG management tool was actually launched here at Change Now. I think it was three years ago, if I remember well, with the UN. 
and I remember that moment, uh, and I remember that I signed up immediately, and I was one of, and I looked at it, and it's incredible for businesses. So thank you, Nguyen. Um, Ernst, uh, how about you? For uh, uh, students that uh, you know, they want to get involved either with uh, um, Erasmus Enterprise uh, or for people that want to develop careers as well, and they're interested also in getting involved in Envue, what's the next step? No, I think we are a Rotterdam-based university, right? Sort of we have 40,000 students, 4,000 uh, uh, academics. Um, so on both ends, we facilitate entrepreneurship, actually. And um, so if you want to get involved, it is also to challenge your own, your own school, right? Your own faculties. Um, and if they don't facilitate, you know, step out of, the, uh, step out of the, the line from time to time and actually start exploiting, right? Start exploring. And because this is, this is also the time of life as a student that you can start doing so. A couple of friends of mine who were very successful entrepreneurs, they never graduated. I shouldn't be promoting that part, but at the end of I, the day... You got, you got one here. <laughs> we, all know, we, we all know how that, how that runs, you know. Not all of the, uh, the subjects might be equally of interest to you. So, you know, uh, take that plunge from time to time. Six months out, you haven't achieved anything. Uh, you can always go back to university, right? Sort of. Yeah. I would, I would definitely uh, encourage that. If you want to do in the impact space, you know, Envy can offer obviously their, uh, their, uh, their are solutions. So Envyu.org is the organization that I represent here as well, um, and uh, and uh, obviously this is also where people can uh, can sign up or or help in uh, in that space. And it's massively interesting. I must say, I'm super impressed by the people that not only their minds but also put their heart do something and, and, and give, that, uh, give that specific boost within that framework of entrepreneurship and, yeah. uh, uh, and making great impact. And I think that that's the main difference of social entrepreneurs. Everyone, every social entrepreneur I've ever met, they put their heart and soul in every single project because they're not just doing it because there is an opportunity to make money. They're doing it because they care. They deeply care and it's core to them. And um, uh, so thank you for, for the work that you're doing. Uh, Lo, uh, how about you? So someone wants to get involved with the snowball effect, uh, they want to explore some of the projects, which uh, I actually want to mention one that I saw in the list of projects that you show me at the stand, uh, was the library of everything, if I remember well. And it's an incredible concept uh, of uh, a library where instead of renting books, you can actually rent everything. Things, <laughs> yeah, things. things. Things, not everything, but things. And that was, for me, a, an exceptional concept uh, in that can help use material more and more and use goods more and more. But if someone wants to explore some of these projects, what's the best way? You just go on snowball-effect.org. You see the list of projects, and then you click on the button. And, and then we have a first talk with you, and we tell you what are the next steps if you want to go further on that very specific project. And if you're still hesitating and you don't know if social entrepreneurship is made for you and replicating one is made for you, then we also have another program related to career coaching and how to know yeah, what, what career path is made for you in the impact industry. Yeah, I know you have an assessment on that, right? Yeah, we do uh, have Tell us more yeah. about the assessment because uh, I know that there are a lot of people yeah. that they don't have a clue where to start. So I want to make a difference. Where do yeah. I start? I don't know. <laughs> There is, there is actually so many ways. I mean, right now we are talking about entrepreneurship mostly in that session, yeah. but you can have an impact in your career with various different ways. Social entrepreneurship is one, replicating is one, but also being an intrapreneur inside your company or being an employee or being a freelance, if a freelance sorry, in this, in this whole industry. And so it's just a quiz you can find on our website, snowball-effect.org slash quiz. Um, and, and we will just ask you a few questions um, to just have a first feeling of which path is the one for you. Uh, yeah, because you have several criteria that you can check. Thank you very much for developing that. That's an incredibly useful tool. Um, I have a, a final question that I want to ask. Uh, Nguyen, for, from your experience, if someone doesn't know where to start and doesn't have a starting point, because I think there is sometimes a lot of pressure in uh, creating a career in the social impact space. We talk about purpose and your calling, and someone says, well, I, I don't know what it is. What is the best place to start, in your opinion? The first thing that I'll advise is just plug in. Find something that you feel drawn to and plug in somewhere in the ecosystem, even if it's as a volunteer 
or as Laura said, as an entrepreneur, you can work for a social enterprise and start learning. Um, you can take a course or you can take her quiz, like she mentioned, because I feel like in that journey, along the way, you will find what is, draw what is drawing you uh, and which space that you think that would mirror or marry the skills that you, you currently have. So you need to get inspiration, you need to plug in, and then you jump. So inspiration, blogging, find resources, and then uh, jump uh, in it. Uh, Ernst, how about you? If someone doesn't know where to start, what would you be your recommendation? Yeah, obviously also test with your peers. Sometimes it, it, it really helps, you know, validate, validate, validate. You know, if you have a good idea, test it out in your, uh, in, in your direct environment, but really be disciplined about it, right? Sort of, and the second thing sort of, in this domain that we're all operating in, there's a lot of opportunity, right? There's new business models need to be emerged. And don't, you know, start a career in something and you still keep that, you know, creeping up your spine from time to time, you know? And then sort of, uh, sometimes it emerges to you, right? So yeah. just be open, keep your radar open. That is super important. And I would, uh, I would suggest also, don't forget that it has to make some impact in monetary related activity right not saying that you need to be uh, the, the next unicorn but think about it so what is the real business model how do we make money and how do we going to build that and still making impact and you can marry the both worlds we had a, we had some great sessions that we saw that it can happen uh, absolutely so we can marry profitability and impact thank you very much uh, Ernst thank you Lord thank you Nguyen thanks for being here give them a massive round of applause please <laughs> can leave the microphone there thank you And now, <laughs> from uh, exploring different opportunities uh, and options uh, in the career space, uh, there is a very special panel that we have now. Because uh, what we said, uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, is uh, for students uh, also, where do we find universities that can prepare us for the work that we are going to do in the future? But also for entrepreneurs, uh, what other opportunities are there and how also can we hire talent? And that's why I want to welcome here on the stage one of the co-founders co of Change Now, Santiago Lefebvre. Please give him a round of applause. And also co-founder and CEO of Make Sense, Christian Vanizet. Here we go. Side note. If you end up uh, parting with uh, these two, they have crazy dance moves. That's just <laughs> on a side note. But uh, Santiago, uh, co-founder and CEO of Change Now, which is now the largest uh, event uh, for the world and for the planet. Um, how did you come up with this idea, first of all? <laughs> and where did it all start? <laughs> well, everything started from a pain point. Uh, a pain point because I was looking for my own career. Uh, I did an MBA uh, after uh, a first career in finance and then in tech as a tech entrepreneur. I did an MBA at INSEAD just to, well, to think about all my former experience and what I wanted to, to accomplish later. Uh, during this moment, I said, okay, there is a real gap between either we have to do business or we have to do impact. And that's what's so strange for me, you know? I wanted to find something that was just allying both. Um, and I started to, sp to, to spot around the world, people were exactly doing that. And that inspired me. And I said, okay, maybe I, I can help those people to be bigger and bigger being more visible and also to, to help other emerge and create their own projects. And, you know, in the tech industry, you have big events like the CES in Las Vegas and stuff like that. I so said, this is exactly what we have to do, something where we can bring together the whole global ecosystem so they can, uh, so the, each change maker can really uh, grow faster, you know. And that's how the idea came. And, and that was your first career in impact. Yeah, actually, I'm super lucky. I'm one of the luckiest person, I think, because I started impact with, with this, which changed now. And look at this. Uh, and actually, can we give him a round of applause for what he is and his team have been able to create? Now, Christian, uh, it makes sense, uh, even if you do different things from change now, is about bringing 
change makers together as well. It's a global network of more than 200,000 citizens and entrepreneurs that are committed to solving social and environmental issues. And uh, which makes sense, you have supported more than 3,200 local initiatives in more than 100 cities and 45 countries. How did it start? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I was, um, I started as a student. How many of you guys are still students in the room? Okay, cool. So this is the best moment to try something because you, you don't have kids yet, you're not married, so if it fails, you're not gonna be single. Uh, so try now. Anyway, so I started in, in a business school in universities and we did a round the world uh, tour with backpacks to meet social entrepreneurs and share about their initiatives, and this is how Make Sense was born. Uh, and today, we really focus on helping people uh, find a, a meaningful career to have an impact, because actually what we figured is that the, the best individual impact you can have is your work and your job. And so we launched, and this is why I'm here today, we launched a platform named jobs.makesense.org, where you have more than half a million French people who try to look for a career in impact. So these feelings that we all have that we need to do something for the planet and we need to make it our job. Uh, you're not just all of us, I mean, we've changed now, we al already see that it's big and it's shared, but there's a bigger and wider movement that's growing every day, and this is what makes me so hope hopeful. And uh, also having a career in impact apparently makes you grow your hair, because... <laughs> That's yeah, <laughs> uh, the picture is, is lying a bit. I'm going to a career in activism now, so I'm uh, changing my uh, Changing my the image to match uh, <laughs> the stereotype. <laughs> Santiago, I know you're here also because uh, you're creating a partnership with uh, Make Sense in particular um, regarding finding job opportunities. Uh, tell us more about this partnership and what we can expect. Well, yes, uh, we're super happy to, well, we, we start to know each other with Make Sense for a long time now. And we decided that it was really time to, what we tried to do here is, I mean, that means collaborate, you know. And one of the pain points also there is for uh, the younger generations and the, uh, I would say the market, uh, job market, is that there is always a discrepancy between the high growth of those impact startups, impact uh, companies, and the fact that more and more people also want to join them, but uh, they, they don't have really a lot the opportunity to meet. And so we are launching something that we tried earlier, but now for the uh, last, uh, the fourth, th uh, sem uh, sorry, the first, the fourth trimester of this year, we are launching uh, job fairs. Uh, we are coming back with a, a new product, which are the job fairs for impacts. And uh, uh, where is going to be the, the the next one? Well, the first one, first one. the first one will be in Paris uh, because we used to uh, to do it in Paris uh, for the first time uh, before COVID. So this is really something we we want to amplify, and that's why we we collaborate to to do this uh, relaunch of uh, of job fairs. Uh, and then we are definitely considering going into the different uh, ecosystems through Europe, so we can also help making this uh, job market uh, an impact in Europe. I have a question for you, Chris, uh, Christian, regarding uh, uh, the, this collaboration and partnership. Because we uh, change now, we talk a lot about creating partnerships and the importance of partnering. What makes a successful partnership? For us, uh, what would make this partnership successful, I hope, is like in 10 years from now, no one works in jobs that they don't like, and that we can show that there is a way to you don't have to choose between your career and making an impact. And so makes sense, for example, we can't do it on our own, but if you partner with organizations like Change Now, and if we bring more people together, we can create a huge momentum so that even people refuse to go to jobs that don't make an impact. And so this is the, the dream and the hope I have is that in 10 years from now, everyone will be able to have a job that creates an impact. And that jobs, like, yeah, my, 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 my real dream is that no one ever goes work in uh, oil and gas industry uh, because there's so many amazing jobs that pays as much to create impact in renewables and in solving climate change, for example. And so we don't have to choose anymore because one of the problems uh, for people that want to make a, a career in impact is also the salary. You know, sometimes the, there are higher salaries in other careers that are not in impact, and that's why they, attri they attract 
talent. Uh, so there is a lot of work that needs to be done in, uh, in this space. I can jump on this. Please do. Yeah. Um, because when I, I, I come from a very modest background. And so very early, I wanted to find a job that was paying high salaries. You know. um, that's why I started in finance, etc. And, and I wasn't really happy in what, in what I was doing. And I think that one of the things that really um, make me slow in under understanding my way, my own way, is that I was locked in a wrong vision of what's important in life, you know? Because I really believe when you do business that um, the more money you, w you earn, the more value you represent. And I think this is a totally wrong vision of the world. Okay. I think that, and that's why I'm much more happy doing this. Much, uh, it's that I think your life and what you represent is more the impact you have on other people around you. And that's how my new criteria to know if I'm successful or not. Yeah. So we're talking here about changing uh, how the value of people is represented or seen in society. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this, Christian? Yeah, so we did a study recently with a business school named Odensia. And what we realized uh, from the study was that 92% of the people we surveyed wanted to have a, a career that is meaningful. And 57% of the people wanted to have a career in impact. So it's a strong movement in society. And what I'm seeing is that when I started Make Sense 10 years ago, there was not a lot of jobs. Uh, to create impact and at the same time have a salary and make a living out of it. But right now, for example, on the platform that I talked about earlier on jobs, there's right now 25,000 job offers that are open. And it's really amazing because you see this huge growth of the recruitment in that field. You have huge startups like Back Market, for example, is one the most valuable company in France. They're recruiting a, a lot of people and it's a job where you make people buy less phone, and at the same time, it makes revenues and it grows. So there's a lot of examples that we don't need to choose anymore. And so that's what makes me really hopeful. And I don't know, I, I just feel like it just needs to happen faster. <laughs> and I really love the speech of the students at AgroParisTech. I don't know if you guys have seen it. How many of you guys have seen it? Yeah, so for those who just ask the person who raised their hand if you haven't seen it, uh, they, they really tell like, yeah, we, do, we don't want jobs where we destroy the planet anymore. And there's many different ways, as Laura was saying, to create an impact. Of course, you can do like the students say, and you go and you just do farming if you want, or you can join a startup that build impact. You can even be a double agent trying to change the big companies from the inside. There's many ways. The most important is just to, to feel what's good for you and how you feel inside, and, and to be true to your values. Because other, otherwise, you'll wake up 10 years from now and not being happy if you live too long with a, a feeling inside that you're not aligned between your values and what you do every day. And that's a, a life of fulfillment. When you're actually talking about the introduction of this particular session, which is about how do we spend our time in a meaningful way. And that's what makes our life become special, not only for us on a personal level, but also for other people around us. But creating a life uh, like this uh, comes with challenges, right? Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's change the world, uh, let's make an impact, let's make a difference. Uh, but then uh, we face obstacles. What are some of the challenges and obstacles that you're facing in building change now and your own career in impact? Well, for, for me, the main obstacle was really the one of uh, doing the big jump. You know, it's what, what, I, what I said earlier is that you have right. not necessarily the right vision of the world um, and just also to put too much fear in the fact that when you make a choice, sometimes we believe it will be a choice for all your life, you know, and that's wrong. Actually, you can always change about what you have decided at some point. For example, if you want to start something, that's not a big deal. Start something. And then if it's not, not working, you can do something later, okay? It's not because you fail a, f a first company that you will be always a, a failed entrepreneur. That's not true. You can always come back on your decisions. And so that's not so, so a big deal to take some risk at some point. So just do this. And that's what we did, actually. It's a, a, I think uh, the big challenge was, OK, should we go, should we not go? And just for this quick story, I, I, I had to decide at the moment between starting change now 
and joining a startup as a country manager. This was my kind of a dream job at some point. I will open a new country for a startup. And uh, Rose, uh, my co-founder, who's also my wife, uh, told me, OK, what do you want to do? Do you want to try to change the world, or do you want to open parking slots in Spain? Ooh. <laughs> Putting it this way. Yeah. <laughs> put it put it, okay. And so I knew exactly what I had to do at this moment. <laughs> How about you, Christian? What are some of the challenges that you had in building your own career in yeah, the, the challenge 10 years ago was that if you did studies and you wanted to make the work in impact, there was no money. So it was really always a trade off between I have to pay back my student loan or I have to make a job. Or, or like, uh, it's exactly as you said, like also, like if my family like, doesn't have a lot of money, I want to have a good job and it's good for the family. But right now, this challenge doesn't exist anymore. You can s you see, like, we've changed now. This is the industry is big, there's a lot of money that you can have a good job and, and make it. So, this is not an excuse anymore. If any of your colleagues in a business school or engineer school say, yeah, but I want to make money, you say, yeah, 10 years ago you had to choose. Now just go look on Change Now and you look at the company, you see how many millions they raised. Like we had a fund, it was 8 million uh, impact investment fund two years ago, now in two years now it's 100 million. There's so much money in the space. So just convince your friend that they don't have to go work in uh, 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 industries just to get money. They, they can do it. The second thing is to, if you want to change your career and uh, reorientate, um, get uh, some help. There's a lot of uh, amazing nonprofit and training organisms that can help you to make the transition to the impact space. One of them, for example, is called On Purpose. They place you for one year and a half in a big nonprofit or in an impact uh, organization so you can see and transition from your previous career. And it's really cool. On the website, uh, on jobs, that makes sense. You have more than 50 organisms that can help. And so get support because it's not easy. And sometimes you don't even have to be retrained. So for example, you just have, if you were working in marketing, uh, in an agency, for example, you go, just go and do marketing for an impact startup or a, a big nonprofit. So it's, it's, it's even easy. So there's no excuse not to do it anymore. I understand there was excuse 10 years ago, but now everyone should just do it. And, and I think we, can, we should launch a pledge. I hope one day we will launch it, that people will just say no to bullshit jobs because it's the only way the, this thing is going to change. The thing that scares the most the CEO of Total, for example, is that young, brilliant engineers don't go work in their company anymore. So if you talk to all your brilliant, young colleague engineers to say, don't go work there, it's going to force them to change. Because if they don't have talent, they can't build the future. It makes them ask a lot of questions. Why does the people who did the same brilliant study as me don't want to come work for me? And then it asks a lot of questions. So, there's a, some form of activism in refusing to go to jobs that doesn't make the world better. I stand up for what uh, makes the world a better place uh, and uh, stand up for just being in careers that make a positive difference and make a positive change. I know that also being a student, one of the biggest challenges in when you're choosing your studies or your uh, future path that supposedly then is going to determine your career is where do I find universities that actually prepare me for the work uh, as a change maker or in the change industry? And I know you have created and you're working on something to solve this problem as well. Well, uh, actually, yes. Um, two years ago, I've been invited to, uh, to an event in France, which was the COP1 for students. Uh, it's like a COP, but really dedicated to students. And there, I ask a question that I want to ask here. Who's deeply afraid of the future? No, wh when you see this, it always makes something. And I asked this question two years ago just to start the discussion, being, uh, th thinking that there were just a few hands up. And you, when you see this, okay, wow, we need to do something. Why this brilliant people who is doing studies has, is so afraid of the future? I, the, the answer we came with is that they don't feel one prepared for this in terms of uh, curriculum and also they don't see what are the careers that are open for them to, con to, to, to go in the right di direction. So for schools, we say, okay, we need to change the rules because either we go and see each school and say, you have to change your curriculum, you have to change your curriculum, and that doesn't work. Other we say, okay, 
all the schools are based, or the strategy of the schools are based on the rankings. So let's go and start a new ranking, national ranking, huge, that will make them move. And that's why we, we create, uh, we went to see uh, Point Réveil Ecologique, we went with Deloitte, with uh, Les Echo, to create like a small coalition to issue the first uh, ranking of uh, schools and universities to change the world. And this happened last year, and now we are already launching the second edition, which is ongoing right now. And where can people find the ranking? Where can people go to find it? Yeah, well, you can just go uh, on on internet. You you, you put the uh, well. For now, it's in French because it's a it's a pilot. Uh, we are really looking forward to starting an other uh, regions uh, through Europe first. Uh, but just go on Google and and Google it. Yeah, and then that's where you can find it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, um, I love this because uh, when we are talking here is about changing how people see. Just just sorry. sorry. Go on Ecosia and go and Ecosia. Go on Ecosia. And Ecosia. Ecosia, Ecosia, it. Ecosia, it. Ecosia it. Yeah. The, the CEO of Ecosia was actually here, Christian Kroll, on the first day on this panel. And uh, that's we need to change the term from Google it to Ecosia it. And for those of you that don't know what Ecosia is, uh, is a search engine uh, where instead of the money that they earn from the ads, instead of uh, banking them or paying the shareholders, they're actually planting trees. Uh, and they've been planting more than 150 million trees so far. Which is brilliant. So, Ecosia it from now on. Uh, Christian, I have a final question for you because uh, you're very passionate about building movements, uh, but sometimes building a movement uh, and having a career and having different passions and supporting projects, it's quite difficult also to manage your time and see where I'm spending your, my time. What is your idea about uh, how, how, how can you manage that, that career, movement, supporting projects, activism? What's your view on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer the question straight. Uh, I'm, uh, the thing I, I'm really thinking about when we talk about our time and what we see is that we don't have any more time. I mean, there is like three years to start decreasing the carbon emission if we want to be able to still have the Paris Agreement. So there's no more time. So my recommendation <laughs> that I would love is that for the next three years that we have, if there's one thing where we should put all our energy yeah. is on trying to solve this crisis with our jobs, with our activism, whatever you do, because in the fourth year, then you can have regret, but you won't have remorse because you would have tried everything to solve this. And for me, this is really the thing, is like our generation have a timing issue. So just like think about how do you want to spend the next three years we have to make the biggest impact you can so that you have no regrets that we haven't tried everything after. And there's no other generation in human history who have this dilemma and questions that we have to ask ourselves now. So for me, I decided that for the next three years, I will not count my time. I will give everything I have every hour of the day and maybe I will rest after for the next 10 years, but I have a kid, he's four years and a half, and I will not be able to look at him in the eyes and say that I didn't try anything I could in the next three years. So this is my call to all of you guys. Let's just change your job now, join activist groups, do everything you can, burn out if you want, but now is the time, okay? <laughs> Give not tomorrow. it your all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you, Santiago. Give them a massive round of applause. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> if I can leave you with a final message, the time is now. It is time to change now. Thank you. My name is Simone Vincenzi. I will see you in the next session. Have a fantastic rest of the day. <laughs>